Tom, welcome to Australia. It's good to have you here. Well, uh, it's a real pleasure and I would say good day, mate, but uh, I don't want to be accused of cultural appropriation, so it's just a real pleasure. <laughs> I'm sure we can manage that sort of exchange <laughs> between friends. Yeah. Um, but uh, we met in Oxford. Uh, I was particularly struck by the work that you've been doing in the area of understanding trust, its importance to a functioning society and economy, the price we pay for it breaking down. We'll come back to that in a moment. Um, but uh, you fought alongside Australians in the Middle East, I understand. Yeah, so I've served in uniform alongside Australians, particularly in Baghdad in 2006, um, and then to a lesser extent in Afghanistan in the winter of 2006-2007. Um, so it was a real privilege to serve uh, alongside the Aussies, and I've got great respect for their armed forces. I love serving alongside them. And, um, and it, it, it was a very easy fit, with, in, particularly in Baghdad, um, an American-led coalition, uh, and the Brits, I think it's fair to say we were senior coalition par partners in that context, um, but there's a very natural circle of trust with, with uh, those two armed forces and the Aussies as well, and so it made it very easy to operate together. Troubled times, it appears that mm. uh, the, uh, the battle against terrorism is not going to end any time soon. Mm. I wonder sometimes whether in fact part of our problem is that in the West we seem to be confronted by people who are very clear in their minds about what they want and we in the West are very unsure of who we are and what we believe in anymore. It's an interesting cocktail. But um, to come to uh, your role now in Oxford, uh, firstly tell us about Oxford. You know, We think of Oxford and Cambridge as these incredibly famous and unbelievably influential institutions in not just Britain, but throughout the world? So I uh, was educated at Cambridge. I d did my undergraduate degrees and uh, postdoctoral degrees, and uh, I, l I love, love the light blue. I, I learnt a lot um, from it and moved to Oxford uh, about four years ago to take up a position at the Blavatnik School of Government, which uh, is a new school, and we're, we're putting down roots, and I'm very excited to be there. Um, m my overriding impression on moving from Cambridge to Oxford um, so for an external observer, the similarities outweigh the differences. Uh, they're ancient universities and, they, and they've got a lot in common. Um, but having experienced both, the particular strength of Cambridge lies in natural science, and it's very, very good at doing that. Lots of Nobel Prize winners in, that, in, uh, in science. Um, and, uh, and Oxford is particularly striking for its public engagement. And uh, the student body is very politically engaged, much more so in my experience than Cambridge. Um, although that may reflect changes in the national consciousness in the, in the time, even in the short time, uh, from the early 2000s to where, to where we are today. Um, and there's, there's, a, there's a much more of a revolving door between London in particular as a centre of political, and financial and cultural power uh, with the influence of Oxford and in fact internationally. Uh, so many heads of states have, have come through Oxford. Oxford's door and it's a great privilege to be working with future heads of state uh, in, in, the, in the classrooms. Well, what are you teaching now? Uh, so I, I teach uh, a course called Foundations and we think on that course about the moral and political um, uh, factors, reasons, values that, sh that should and that do undergird public policy internationally. Um, and this is something of a new area for me. I'd, I'd, uh, uh, in my doctoral work, I thought about questions of epistemology, questions of ethics, uh, but I'm now very much focused on uh, the macro questions of um, what are the principles by which pu public life should be guided. And uh, I've greatly enjoyed doing that. And I teach a very internationally diverse cohort. So we have 60 to 70 countries represented in the classroom. Um, so it's a fascinating cross-section of the currents, the political currents that are taking place internationally at the moment. It's an interesting question, isn't it, that I think it's often overlooked now, is that there are very close ties between, if you like, the economic performance of a society mm. and an economy, and the, and, the, and the beliefs and the values and the behaviour yep. uh, that, if you like, uh, underpin it. Yep. Uh, I would argue, for example, that in many ways the current horrendous level of indebtedness in the West arose because of cultural factors, the obsession with me that began in the 60s, I must be comfortable and if I can't afford it, governments must provide it for me. And in many ways, our refusal to own the fact that we've loaded ourselves and more importantly, our children and our grandchildren with debt uh, 
uh, means because we won't come to grips with it, we won't own it, we won't uh, concede our responsibility for it, we carry on in a way that suggests to me that it's cultural factors that are posing the great danger to our kids, that are preventing us, if you like, from moving forward and resolving some of these problems. Yeah, so, um, and in some sense, this is where my interest in the notion of trust came from uh, in, in the first case, because it, I think at a, at a personal level, we have a very intuitive sense of the value of relationships that are based on trust. And when there's distrust, that there's a kind of poison in the atmosphere. And uh, I've certainly been very sensitive. You, know, you sort of, you, you see that at a personal level. Um, but I think the, you know, Trust matters for our societies in terms of how well we collectively are going to be able to do. And um, now, so there's a conflicting research on this from a social science perspective. So economists tend to be very sceptical about cultural factors. I tend to be very sceptical about economists, so the, you know, the, the compliments repaid. Um, but it just seems to me beyond doubt that the moral ecology of a society has quite profound implications on the forms of cooperation that you can get going. And so just to try and flesh that out in a couple of areas. Um, so the two obvious areas of the economy and uh, public life, public sector. And uh, both of these in different respects rely um, to, to, to achieve just efficiency across a society you need to be able to have a default assumption that the people you're engaging with are engaging on the same terms as you and that there's, so I, just in general terms, within the, the competitive hurly-burly, there's some stuff which stands outside of that and which you're not going to renege on. So let me just illustrate that. Um, so banking, for instance, you know, is a paradigm today of competitive hurly-burly, if I can put it that way. Uh, you know, there's big bonus checks floating around. Uh, there's, a lot, there's a lot of money to be made. Um, but it looks like we now have these cycles of crashes that have been hitting our economies over the last 30 years. And one of the recurring features of those is that there's a new form of financial instrument that's been pioneered. And uh, in the wake of that, so as is always the case, innovation precedes regulation. So regulation follows on from people doing the wrong thing. Always been the case. Always been the case. For centuries. And the, uh, in each case, you've got unscrupulous people who are out for what they want to get out of it, who then see the ways of exploiting these instruments to others' detriment and, uh, and the consequences the system blows up. And obviously 2007, subprime loan uh, crisis um, uh, engulfed engulf the entire financial system as a result of that. So, and this contrasts with a prior way of banking, which dominated the City of London at least, um, in certainly until 1986 or so, that you know, quotes the Big Bang is what it's referred to, deregulation, um, and with that was a, was a change in attitude about what the individual financier was about. And whereas previously, I mean, the, so there was, a, there was a rich network of duties that each, each banker had, so duties to customers, to stockholders, to creditors, to debitors. And in, in the context of that, you're trying to work for everyone's best interests. Um, and, uh, and obviously that's been washed away by a, by a desire for um, uh, personal self-interest seeking, which has been actively promoted by the incentive-based schemes which, which dominate the finance industry today. So, our econ so we see in banking very clearly a pattern uh, which has uh, much wider application. So professions generally rely on this fiduciary commitment from the professional to the person they're acting on behalf of. So when you contract with a lawyer, you want to know that the law is acting in your best interests and not just to make the most money out of you as possible. Same with a doctor, same with teachers, um, and even just the private sector more generally. So um, uh, large-scale corporations are a way of solving um, the problem of uh, local asymmetries or sort of local particularities of the environments that people are operating in. And um, there's a need, uh, so the corporation needs to be assured that each individual is, is not shirking on the job and is working in the best interest of the corporation. And without that, you then get into very intensive monitoring schemes, very intensive incentive schemes, and it's just inefficient as a result of that. So uh, I believe the data is high trust, 
high trust levels within a society are worth about 2% of GDP growth on average. Um, so you can see the impact that this has across, across a society. That's extraordinary. Uh, interesting observation from Australia where the banks are not exactly flavour of the month at the moment. There's a great breakdown in trust. Uh, the f story about a federal MP whose polls were not going well. Uh, and he simply said to the banking representative body in this country who were querying about his attitude on banks, he said, you need to understand when I'm in trouble with my electorate, all I've got to do is go out and bash the banks for a few days and I'm popular again. And it's true. Yeah, well, right. I think it reflects that distrust now mm. that people have, not just for banks. Mm. It can't have always been thus. Trust must have played a major part in the extraordinary economic and social progress of Western societies. Mm. Where did it come from and what role did it play? Okay, so um, the short answer is these questions are very difficult to answer from a, um, in terms of doing the social science data gathering. Uh, it's very difficult to disentangle cause and effect. But part of the significance of my work on trust is that I'm trying to disentangle um, the, the rational relations between the attitudes of trust that we have and the virtues, in particular, the virtue of trustworthiness that grounds that trust. So in order for large-scale cooperation to be possible, you need to be able to, <clears throat> if I can put it this way, you need to be able to hand off trust very easily. So, Imagine if we're um, in a kind of Hobbes-like state of nature where there's total distrust everywhere, there's total anarchy. We can come to trust each other if we've got a track record of interaction where I've got a basis for thinking that you're going to do the right thing by me. And we sort of start off slowly and gradually build, build up that interaction. But the pressing question for me then becomes how do I extend that trust to someone else? Because if I then rely on building up another track record, you can just see that the speed of interaction, of cooperation to our mutual benefit, is just massively slowed down. So the, the, the question for cultures of trust is how you can hand off trust, how you can make sure that there's a sufficiently widespread general sense of trustworthiness that we're able to just get on with the business of trusting and working together without having to worry too much about that kind of information cost. So, so what are the means by which this comes? Well, there's a few, um, and three that I think are worth highlighting. So the first, <clears throat> the first is the significance of institutions. Uh, so institutions provide a way for the track record of individuals to be tested by an institution, and the institution then becomes a proxy for your ability to trust those members of it. So the medieval guilds, we're an early way of building up that kind of trust. So that's the first way. Um, and that's also why damage to uh, institutions' reputation is so significant, because it doesn't just undermine what you can do with that institution, it undermines the ecology of trust, which sustains easy cooperation. So the second uh, mechanism is um, a shared emotional loyalty to each other. So just think about the family. If, if you've got bonds of love and affection, it's just very easy to trust other people because you know that they're, they care for you and because they care for you, they're looking out for your best interest. And trust is very easy in that environment. And obviously uh, the family is quite unique in terms of the degree of <clears throat> uh, emotional bonds. But we have different kinds of emotional bonds with different kinds of particular communities that we have loyalties to. Um, so we have loyalties to the neighbourhood, to uh, the, the city that we come from, to the civil society institutions, the bowling club, the church that we might be a member of. Uh, we have loyalties moving up to regions, we have loyalties to countries. And all of these serve as mediators for uh, for trust, that if you know that you have something in common with each other, you're able to, um, it's a basis for certain kinds of trust. Um, and the third basis is, is, a, is a kind of universal moral commitment, so a commitment to doing the right thing. And historically, uh, the most influential um, force here are relig religious communities. Um, and my own tradition, the Christian church, has been a very powerful inculcator of moral commitment. And a moral commitment that has a universal requirement, so that you're going to be trustworthy for those who are outside the in-group, as well as trustworthy for those who are inside. So there's three mechanisms 
are complementary um, and they provide a way for trust to embed itself within a society. What then is behind the breakdown of trust in our institutions, even between ourselves, between electors and elected, that seems so endemic in your country, in Australia now, in, across Europe, America, the democracies. Yep. What's broken down that trust? Okay, so... It's a big question, it's a I big, know. It's a big question. But, and, uh, I mean, with these things, there's, there's just a complex of different factors which are going to interweave, and uh, disentangling them is, uh, uh, is tricky. So I think, um, let, me, let me pull out th three factors again, which I think are particularly important. So, um, one of them is, um, when we were talking about the, uh, the bonus payment structures in the banking mm -hmm. industry, I think that's representative of a larger train of thought, uh, which has given people permission to look, for the, look out for themselves first. And the, the effect, I mean, the actual effect of earning a lot of money tends to be social insulation. So the more money you have, the bigger house you live in, the sort of bigger garden, the more, the more distance you end up putting yourself um, uh, from, from neighbours. And I think often one of the dangers that, that money can bring is a, is a, a sense of entitlement and a sense of, um, uh, a sense of, well, I've earned this and what, what do I owe to others? And that, that sort of the social bonds, uh, it, it just seems to me there, there's a weakening that's happened as, as a result of that. So another factor is just people doing bad things. Uh, so we learn to distrust people when they, yeah. do, when they do bad things. So in the UK, we've had the expenses scandal in Parliament, uh, the financial crisis. There's just a clust cluster of things which have, uh, we're very publicly aware of, and they just damage trust because you see people who are, who are out for themselves. So in some ways, that becomes a rational, a rational response. So there are emergence of forms of politics, um, excuse me, which, which I suppose my take would be seem to be quite tightly based on claims of victimhood um, and a privileging of the claims of victims over against obligations to wider society or indeed the membership of wider society. And um, it's, it's just very easy to see the damage this does. So if the premise of our conversation was I'm really annoyed at the fact that you didn't annoy, reply to my email yesterday and I'm, re I'm just going to stand here and hold it against you. I'm just going to keep on holding it against you that you didn't. That just kind of breaks the, it breaks the relationship with us and it's very difficult to see what basis we go on from there. Now that's a very trivial example and there are plenty of claims of victimhood which have uh, very significant bases in fact uh, and clearly that needs to be acknowledged, it needs to be recognised and the consequences of that wrongdoing uh, needs to be undone. But at the point at which our politics becomes structured around those claims of victimhood and structured around accusation, the possibility of reconciliation and healing becomes very, very difficult to achieve. And I'm, I'm sorry to say, I think, I think we've seen something of a race to the bottom in terms of claim, claims for victimhood, where um, it's in the interests of any interest group to, to shout louder about um, you know, the wrongs that have been done to you. Um, and if that's the premise for our politics, we're, we're, we're riding a tiger which at some point will, will eat the rider and then eat itself. So it's a very dangerous situation to be in. Um, and I think the third thing, um, it's, it, it's, it's a sensitive subject and it needs to be um, handled with care, uh, but the role of immigration within, uh, within different societies uh, is a factor in reducing trust. Um, so there's uh, quite a lot of data from social science that shows that um, more diverse, so whether that's on ethnic grounds or religious grounds, um, uh, sort of cultural background grounds, uh, the more diverse neighbourhoods are, the lower the level of trust uh, there is. So it just looks like there's a trade-off between multiculturalism and the levels of trust. Heterogeneous societies do poorly on these, on these levels, homogeneous societies do well. And um, it's important to be in a position of personal welcome to individuals who've come to uh, build better lives for themselves, particularly in affluent societies. And you know, nothing I'm saying counts in any way against that. But the consequences for social cohesion of unrestricted immigration and very fast-paced immigration have been very significant. 
And there's a very real challenge uh, for us to rebuild uh, the bases of societal cohesion given, uh, given these changes. So, uh, so I, at the moment I come down on, uh, on the view that in our current context what's needed is breaks on the level of immigration uh, in order to allow societies to, to sort of rebuild a sense of who they are and for there to be an embedding of, of relationships. But just to put this in terms of numbers, so in the UK context, some people say, you know, which is true, the UK has had waves of immigration in the past, and that's absolutely true. Uh, and they'll say, well, you know, look, we had 50,000 Huguenots turn up in the, uh, in the 17th century. And uh, 50,000 Huguenots, it was great to welcome them and give them respite from religious persecution. Um, but that's a drop in the ocean compared with the numbers uh, of the volume of immigration that we're seeing at the moment. Oh, and the Huguenots would have had a much greater affinity with many of the people in Great Britain at the time anyway. Sure. Yeah. Uh, so in many ways I would have thought they'd have messed quite quickly, pre-days of commitment to what's now called multiculturalism. Yeah. I sometimes wonder, and again you've got to be very careful how you put this, but going to I think what you're saying, that if you're not careful multiculturalism can become zero culture, you end up undermining the core values, including trust, mm. that made Western societies free and open and prosperous mm. uh, in the interests of not wanting to offend, in inverted commas, other people who come here. And yet I think that's a disservice to both sides. Right. And so I think there's a, um, one of the puzzles that I've uh, really sort of struggled with in this context is um, if, if you genuinely believe in diversity and value the particular contributions that different cultures have to offer, um, you've also got to value the conditions that make diversity possible. And the conditions that make diversity possible are a certain level of, uh, as it were, immobility or non-fluidity. So if everything's in flux, everything turns grey, and we just end up with a monoculture. And it may be that you think that monoculture is the most valuable thing there is, and that, that's fine. But if you actually believe in diversity, if you believe in diverse communities which have their own structures, histories, sense of self, distinctive contributions they can bring, you've got... So, so the analogy here is an ecological one. Um, so biodiversity relies on there being barriers to transit for species. So the Galapagos Islands has fantastic biodiversity because it's very difficult to get there. And cultures are absolutely the same. So now, um, are we swimming against the tide of history here? Well, we're definitely swimming against the tide of technology because technology and globalisation and the wealth that it brings makes global movement far, far easier. Uh, but it ultimately is a political decision in the capitals of uh, countries internationally whether they have the political will to, um, to control immigration for, for the benefit of uh, the citizens who are already in that country. Perhaps a useful segue into uh, a Brexit. Yeah. Uh, after all, uh, immigration was, I suspect, a major player there, but so too was the gap between the people who felt their first loyalty was to their country and those who had no loyalty or less loyalty to their country saw themselves as global citizens, yeah. sometimes now called uh, the somewheres mm. and the anywheres. How is uh, this... Uh, whole debate around Brexit for an Australian sort of looking in, best understood. Okay, uh, so um, you referred to David Goodhart's analysis there, it's a very good book, The Road to Somewhere, and it provides, a, I think, a very compelling way of understanding some of the um, coalitions of social outlook that we're seeing, and uh, I think what is an interesting point is that the within society differences are increasingly more significant than the between society differences. Yeah. So, Fascinating. So a social liberal in London has more in common with a social liberal in Istanbul, in Sydney, uh, in Moscow in fact, than they do with a steel worker from Sheffield who may well have more in common with um, uh, you know, a farm worker in, in uh, rural France or something like that. And so the force, the, um, when uh, Goodhart refers to any, anywheres and somewheres, what he's referring to that is a cluster of attitudes which correlate with, in some sense, your sense of allegiance, your sense of identity. Uh, so anywheres implicitly think of themselves as global citizens. Uh, they tend to be socially liberal in outlook. Um, correlates very tightly with whether you're tertiary educated, 
So if you've been to university, you're very likely to share this cluster of attitudes. You tend to, got, uh, tend to have excellent career prospects in a service-based, knowledge-based, information-based economy. Um, whereas some ways will tend to be more socially located, uh, more sense of loyalty to the place where they are, quite possibly more socially immobile, much more likely to live within five, ten miles of where they've grown up, more likely to marry someone who they've, in the area they've lived, uh, much more likely to have single earner families, whereas anywheres will tend to have two earner uh, families where both members of the couple are earning. And there's, there's, a, there's a sort of like small siege, sort of gentlish social conservatism, which, uh, uh, which is very natural for the somewheres. And I think what we're seeing is, is uh, as technology and finance create greater fluidity and liquidity in not just in the economy but in society, we're seeing sorting, so sort, sorting by people's preferences. And effectively in the UK, the university towns and paradigmatically London, to a lesser extent Manchester, uh, draws in the anywheres and then the, the somewheres stay in the rest of the country. Now the fascinating thing about Brexit uh, is, so firstly the referendum is effectively, uh, is effectively a lightning rod question for whether you're an anywhere or somewhere. It just elicits, do you identify with the country or do you identify with some greater than country loyalty? So it's just a lightning rod. So people often say referendum is a terrible um, tool for making policy, and I have some sympathy with that. And, you know, that there's a question of the, the role of referenda, but, um, uh, but what's certainly true is that pretty much everyone in this debate is voting on the basis of their emotional instincts rather than the basis of their considered judgment on the policy question, which is should UK be a member of the institutional, the sort of set of institutions that comprises the EU. So that's the policy question. So even highly educated anywheres, you're saying, tended to see this question through the lens of their feelings and emotions rather than their intellectual grasp of the realities? Of course. I mean, so it's that, an interesting point. That, I mean, that's the nature of humanity. Like, we're deeply emotionally driven beings. All the research from psychology says that emotions proceed, and then we get to work on the post hoc rationalizations afterwards. Now, and I'm not dismissing the role for argument. You know, we need to be committed to argument and reason it out. But at the end of the day, one's initial emotional judgment is certainly the most powerful predictor of, the, of which way you're going to come. So, I mean, and so that's a call, call for humility for everyone involved in it. So, to, you know, I have, it, I have somewhere instincts, that's my kind of deep emotional makeup. So, to what extent am I rationalising my emotional preferences in terms of my policy views? Uh, but, the, but there's a two cockway, I mean, that just applies to everyone across the board. Okay, so the, the two other things. The fascinating thing about Goodhart's analysis is the numbers involved. Uh, so, somewhere, uh, rather, anywheres make up about 20 to 25 percent of the population. This is based on opinion polling data. And those with somewhere instincts make up about 50 percent of the population. And there's a cohort of what he calls in betweeners, and there's, there's a fringe outlier at either end. Um, so there's about a two to one ratio of people who instinctively have somewhere preferences over those who have anywhere preferences in the population. But that is not represented in the corridors of power. So in the corridors of power, so that's what I'm thinking here of as the culture creating institutions of the media and the academy, uh, wall to wall, anywheres. In sometimes known as the elites. Sometimes known as the elites. And the same is true for le the legislatures and the financial institutions and the people who make decisions about how we live. And so just at a kind of anecdotal level, um, you know, I've lost count of the number of conversations where people just sort of, in, uh, uncon it's like an unconscious tick to just be rude about, uh, in, in this debate, leavers as basically racists and xenophobes. And, uh, uh, and to do so just assuming that they're in, all the people listening just automatically agree. Um, and uh, and that, it, it's that unconscious, those sort of, just like those little kind of sociological cues that are, that are indicators of the construction of a consensus within the bubbles and the enforcement of a consensus, that it becomes very costly for individuals to speak out. So, uh, so that was the first point, the numbers. And so the, consequ the consequence of that is the surprising fact about Brexit uh, is not that it was 
a vote for Leave. The surprising fact about Brexit was how close it was. And the reason it was close, the reason it wasn't a much more significant vote for Leave, was because uh, what in the UK is referred to as Project Fear. So um, uh, this was the attempt by David Cameron in particular, who was campaigning obviously very strongly for a Remain vote, to, uh, to portray the consequences of a vote to Leave as, as apocalyptic and basically Armageddon. And we'd probably have World War III within five years. So, you know, this, this, was the, this was the picture. And, um, Project Fear was successful, so a proportion of people who instinctively would vote to leave listened to what the people who they think are in the know were telling them and believed that and, and modified their vote accordingly. And so um, uh, the, it was very funny in the, uh, I mean I laugh, it was a time of great joy for me, but you wouldn't know that in terms of the public conversation for the first two weeks after the vote. And um, uh, so Everyone in the media was just in a state of cognitive dissonance, kind of, you know, this is no longer the country I thought it was. And, um, uh, and so in an effort, I think basically to, to smear the electorate, uh, there was a determined attempt to find regretful leavers. So these were people who had voted leave and then would question it in the two or three days afterwards. Pound took a beating immediately afterwards, great sense of uncertainty, and uh, people were not quite sure what they did. And what was totally missed out of the story were the regretful remainers. Yeah. And there were large proportions of people, you know, uh, close friends, and uh, who, who, whose instincts were leave, but who believed, believed Project Fear, wrongly it seems to be, um, and, uh, uh, and voted against what they emotionally thought. Would. Anyway, sorry, so that's the first point. The second point that's really striking about, uh, about the Brexit vote. Uh, Turnout in British elections has been declining for 15 years or so, um, and the referendum changed that, so there was a spike in turnout. And approximately 3 million people turned out to vote in the referendum who had not voted in previous general elections. And because the pollsters weren't um, asking the questions, they weren't expecting this, we don't know which way they voted. But these 3 million extra voters overwhelmingly turned out in the North and in Wales. And these are the areas that voted strongly for leave. And these are the people who are the poor and they're the, they're the socially marginalised and they've got no voice in public conversation and they've been, they've been treated very badly for many years. Sorry, excuse me. And they've turned out and they've told, they've, they've said to London, this has to change. Yeah. You have to do something different about this. Mm. And what was the response? The response has been a year where the people in London have thought, can we ignore the referendum? Yeah. And there have been serious discussions about overturning the referendum, running it again, how can we avoid the conclusions of this? And we have this extraordinary situation where the people who for many years have been saying we're on the side of the victims, the oppressed, the people who are on the outside, are now actively dismissing and actively smearing and actively rejecting those who've come out and said, we need to be heard. And there's a, we're in a, it's really volatile right now. And it's a, there's a real question, there's a question for the British political system as to whether, whether the people who have the power are able to listen to this and to say, we're going to hear this cry for change and we're going to answer it and we're going to recognise that. And um, it's, I mean, the, the, we are in very volatile times. There's different ways of reading what's happening. It's certainly the case that Jeremy Corbyn has picked up on the economic mm. dimensions of that. Uh, but I think it would be a great, great mistake for sort of the juggernaut of identity politics and, and policy making in the interests of the, the tertiary educated was to, was to get back on the bandwagon and... Um, so, so we're in testing times right now as to whether, whether these electoral results are, are democracy's inherent capacity for self-correction or, or whether it's an indicator of, um, uh, in some cases, sort of pathological bad tendencies coming, coming to the surface. And I think there's just conflicting swirls going in different ways and um, uh, I'd be rash to make any predictions. <laughs>
Well, it's a very big question because in many ways you'd have to say Malcolm Muggeridge might have said we really are starting to eat ourselves out from within. It's not mm. as if there's barbarians coming over the hill. Mm. We're doing it to ourselves. Mm. We're eroding trust. And you paint a very rich picture there of a profoundly, essentially anti-democratic attitude amongst many of the elites. They don't really believe in the people they say they speak up for. In fact, I heard a very interesting um, a man who is obviously elderly, I can't remember his name, uh, on a rebroadcast of a BBC interview here, and he had been an active socialist for much of his life. He was saying working people need to understand that the modern Labor Party, modern Labor movement is much more interested in individual groupings and identity politics and in fact the environment in many ways. See, uh, they actually see the people, if you like, mm -hmm. that they used to once live for and seek to elevate to full recognition of uh, you know, our society, a sort of universalism, they actually in many ways now see the common masses as the problem because they're the people with plasma television sets and smoky old motor cars and um, you know, inefficient heaters destroying the environment. So you've had this massive shift and a very patronising one and you're seeing a big kickback, I think, from people who feel marginalised and underrepresented. That's a heady and dangerous cocktail for any system of government, including, it would seem to me, democracy in an age when so many people don't feel represented by what ought to be the ultimate model for them all having their say. Yeah, and so th this, there's this deep question of um, what I've been describing, I think, could really uh, it's really an instance of capture. Uh, so in the same way that regulatory bodies can be captured by the organisations they're supposed to be regulating, this is governance capture, where a particular subset of the population seems to be governing in accordance with their own preferences and, and, and interests, which in some sense is no surprise, but what is, what is surprising is that we haven't yet seen the realignments at the uh, party level which provide expression uh, for that. And I think, um, so I think one of the consequences of this sort of separating out, roughly speaking, the, you know, in, along the anywhere somewhere lines and the dominance by the anywheres, um, is that there's been a pathologizing of somewhere attitudes and a pathologizing of uh, j just, when I say old fashioned, I mean that in the best possible way, just kind of older ways of living that were just good ways of living, they were good yeah. for individuals, they were good for families, they were good for neighbourhoods, they were good for civil society. And these were the contexts in which people learnt habits of discipline and they learnt habits of responsibility and they learnt the habits of caring for each other. And that's under threat for some of the reasons we've been, uh, we, we've been talking about it, but the pathologising of those ways of living will lead to kickback and uh, that, you know, there's a number of factors for why Donald Trump was elected, but some of that was, was a rejection of that pathologising that's been happening. Tom, coming to what you're doing here in Australia and germane to everything we've been talking about, in these very uncertain times, people are feeling insecure economically, I think politically, socially, and now, in a sense, because of terrorism as well. Put all of those together, I sense an emerging tendency to want to flee towards security, even if it means surrendering hard-won and normally fiercely defended liberties. That's what you've been talking about in Australia. Am I right to be concerned? Uh, about the loss of these hard-won liberties. Yeah, and the rush to security. Yeah. So Sometimes without thinking what it might mean for our liberties. Yeah. Um, so two comments. The, the first is, in terms of the process, there's no question that uh, deliberating about what policy measures, what security measures to take, uh, doing so in the wake of a terrorist atrocity is the worst time to do that, just for obvious reasons, because the hurt and the shock of, of the attack on the body politic and people's lives being lost and damaged um, is is so present and so w there's a call for calm and for collectedness. Uh, and yet, if I can say so as one who's been a politician, that's the very moment when people say, help, you know, stop this, don't let this happen again. Yeah. And so politicians, understandably, feel the need to respond to that urgent demand for security. Yeah. But as you say, it can be dangerous. 
Absolutely. So the, in the long run, um, one of the questions that every society has to solve is what is uh, what are the claims of, in particular, the state? What is its proper jurisdiction? Uh, what is the what are the dimensions of individual and societal life that the state gets involved in? What, where, where does the state say, okay, we are now going to impose our norms, uh, our practices on this area of life? Uh, so the the question of where that line is drawn is a pressing one, and I think we have a compelling interest and a, and a claim in making sure that, that we don't see a gradual erosion, uh, a gradual encroachment of the state on uh, increasing portions of our life. And it's, uh, my fear is always that the, the frogs in, in warm water becoming boiling water, and the worry is for us that incremental change on each small area, which looks justified at each time, cumulatively adds up to a significant extension and encroachment. And then what it means to be a free people where the government serves the people, serves society, changes to, to one where people's lives are structured around what the state wants. So, um, so that's the first comment in terms of t we need to be careful not to rush to security. Um, the second comment is in, in this particular instance, so I was uh, talking at the Centre for Independent Studies, uh, uh, about where this boundary line should be drawn. And what, I was, what I'm trying to argue is that, um, in broad brush terms, police scene and security work, intelligence-driven work, can be compared to fishing in an analogy. And uh, we may con you can contrast fishing with a hook versus fishing with a net. And uh, so when you fish for a hook, obviously you're casting the line, you're trying to pick the individual fish out and trying to get the right fish when you do so. Whereas with a net, obviously you're trawling, you're picking up everything that's there and then throwing out the stuff you don't want to find the one that you do. And it just seems to me that it's characteristic of a free society that the police work, the security work, the intelligence work is done with a hook rather than with a net. So fully support, obviously, targeted surveillance. Uh, when there's reasonable suspicion that someone's up to no good, we need to be going after them with all the resources that we can spare, uh, all the resources that we can make available, and uh, preventing terrorist atrocities. And at the same time, it's a condition on a free society that we're not trawling through, the government doesn't have the power to trawl through ev everyone's communications just as standard in order to make that possible. And it, it is a matter of judgment, Plenty of people whose, whose judgments I respect come down on the other side, uh, but it seems to me that this is a line that's worth defending. Yeah, it's where, where to put the line, I'm sure, is the issue. Let's then seek to, in view of the very serious issues we've been talking about, establish some grounds for hope. As I see it, frankly, what was unique about the West was the emphasis on the worth and dignity of all. The king has to respect the peasant just as the peasant has to respect the king. It gives rise to the idea of the rule of law, even the boat. Uh, that, it seems, had its genesis quite radically as a doctrine, really, uh, in, in, in Christian belief. We've largely abandoned that. I do wonder whether we've tossed the baby out with the bathwater. We're actually costing ourselves dearly with that loss of significant commitment to one another and a recognition that I may not like them, may disagree with them. We may have massive differences, but that person you know, has every bit as right to be around, every bit as much of a right to be around as I do. I wonder whether we haven't lost that mm. and whether that's not at the heart of the mistrust and the dislike that we seem to feel now towards one another. Yeah, so um, I think in terms of how we re rebuild trust, I think there's, uh, so let me just pick out three things which I think are relevant. So the, the first is, uh, as, you, as you pick up, one of the founding stones really bequeathed by its Christian inheritance is uh, a commitment to the equal value and equal worth of every individual. Not the sameness, so, in fact, equality and difference. Right, and so, and so the significance of that e and it's, it's, it's also, so with the equal worth and the equal respect, it's actually not enough just, as it were, for each individual to be weighted in that way. Um, you've got to also be convinced that they're capable of contributing. Yeah. That, so that you, have, you have to think that what they've got to say is, is worth listening to. And even though you disagree, uh, 
there should be that default assumption of humility that I'm going to take seriously what the other person I says. Couldn't agree more. And uh, that's encouraging. <laughs> and, uh, well, I had uh, some research yeah. done into disaffected people in regional Australia yeah. when I was in okay. government. One of the things that kept coming up was they felt we'd, they would say, we feel we're making a contribution to the best of our ability. It mightn't be much, but hey, no one seems to respect me for it. They don't feel respected. And so scorn, it seems to me, like scorn is like pouring, uh, it's like pouring sand in the cogs of, not just democracy, in the cogs of society. Uh, because if you scorn other people and you think they've fundamentally got nothing to contribute. So the, the question is how, like, how do we recover that sense of the, like the fundamental contribution that everyone can make coming from their unique, who they are uniquely. And um, I think, I think the internet is, is just, the internet's basically making us mad. <laughs> um, and uh, it's very difficult from behind a screen to, ref you ref implicitly refract what, what you're seeing through your kind of way of looking at the world. And, uh, and you, you basically see all the worst parts of someone else when you're, when you're engaging It seems to me that it's, te it's technology. It is the greatest facilitator of communications of all time, but has turned out to be the greatest restrictor of genuine freedom of speech and debate of all times. Okay, and so there's a lar really alarming echo uh, sort of illustrations of the echo chamber effect and the, mm. and the division of society into, into sort of a red tribe and a blue tribe, basically. And so the question is how we overcome that. So to, 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 two comments on that. So one is I think the value of face-to-face -face engagement and face-to-face -face lives, geographically lived lives. Uh, so that has implications just for how we conduct ourselves individually to try and make sure that we're exposing ourselves, we're in friendship with and in partnership with people who just see the world differently to us and that commitment to doing that just has an implicitly moderating effect. And there's a policy dimension to that as well, that there are policies which can facilitate geographical embeddedness and locatedness uh, and there are policies which can blow that apart and I think we should be favouring policies that favour it. And um, this doesn't quite, it doesn't fit with the sort of conventional left-right economic policies, uh, but there are going to be bits that need to be drawn on from the sort of across the spectrum repertoire of ways of thinking about it. And then f I think finally, um, I think we need a, like a renaissance of the human heart um, that we, um, every economist knows that GDP is not the measure of a nation's worth or a life's worth, um, but we need to f we need to feel that, and I think we need to have space within within our culture and society and our lives to ask the bigger questions, and to relocate what matters from you know the esteem I earn I, I earn at my work to to lives lived in community which, and which are orientated towards something greater greater than that and um, I think if we recover if we recover that then there's hope. My personal view is that we ought to never lose sight of the fact that we are first and foremost relational beings and that economics should only be well managed if you like not for the sake of a beautiful set of numbers so to speak but to serve human beings and safeguard our children and our grandchildren's well-being as well so it needs to be responsible but we are first and foremost relational beings. Tom, it's been a pleasure being with you. It's always tremendous to meet an academic making a serious contribution who gets the importance of people. Thank you. Well, it's been my great pleasure. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you.